first game released in the decade of the Game Boy, as no one calls it, is the Japanese exclusive pinball game Hiroshugo Pinball Party. The game was always going to have stiff competition from the excellent Revenge of the Gator, but sadly this one doesn't come close to that. There are two tables to choose from, and both are Spartan. The only targets are tabs to hit that let you spell out Jalico to increase your multiplier. There's so little else to hold your attention. No rails or spinners, or much of anything, really. There are bonus screens, but you won't see them much. You progress up and down screens via warps in the corners of the table, but you'll find yourself dropping much more often than climbing. Once you get down to the bottom screen, moving up is very rare, as the game doesn't so much allow you to aim your shots as hit and hope. The lack of anything interesting is a real negative in a genre where there aren't many aspects you need to get right. But amazingly, this isn't Pinball Party's biggest problem. Possibly the most important thing to get right in a pinball game is the ball movement, the physics and collision detection. If that's solid, the rest of the game basically writes itself. It's all wrong here. Balls bounce in unexpected directions from the flippers, or sometimes not at all. Sometimes the ball passes straight through things. Discard any intuition you think you have from playing pinball in the past, it doesn't apply here. Most frustratingly, on the second table, the gutters seem to suck the ball in where you think it would just rebound off. It's as if the ball climbs the wall and commits suicide over the side. You get a tilt feature, but only on the first table, as far as I can tell, and it doesn't work anyway. An absolute car crash of programming that seemingly wasn't tested at all. There's an annoying part on one of the tables where you're trying to move to the higher screen while this girl in a top hat conjures up a dragon, which then vomits out a fire ghost, which, despite being a non-physical being, can be destroyed by your ball. Fail to do so though, and it sets fire to one of your flippers, causing it to disappear. Inevitably, you drop down a screen, leaving you befuddled at the cheap failure and lack of need for any sort of skill in what should essentially be a game of skill. There's a nice innovation, where sometimes, I don't know what causes this, it just happened a couple of times, your flippers are replaced by a breakout style paddle, or two men with a trampoline in a Game & Watch Fireman kind of way. This adds a couple of minutes of interest to the game, but that's it, and it happens so quickly that there's a good chance you won't react in time, and that ball's over. Allegedly, there are cameos by some of the best-known Jalico characters. I could identify Rit from the Rodland series, and nobody else. I think one of them is a pig, and I've no clue who the swimsuited and top-hatted magician lady is supposed to be. My gaming history education may not be up to scratch, but these other folk may well have been concocted and shoehorned into this game. Sorry, Jalico, your mascots just aren't that famous. The music for Table 1 is alright, but it loops after 13 seconds. That's not an exaggeration, I timed it. Table 2 is even worse. It's party music, if the party was being hosted by Benny Hill. Occasionally, you get a Japanese exclusive that's good enough to make you wonder why other countries were deprived of it, and a small handful that were amazing, and I'll do my best to give them the credit and attention they deserve. Other times, however, you breathe a sigh of relief that we were spared certain games over here. Pinball Party is certainly no party. Hell, it's barely even pinball. If you're grossed out by the idea of wearing recycled shoes that smell of Lysol, I know I am, then why not try World Bowling? There are two characters to choose from, a bowling shoe ugly boy or girl. The boy is right-handed while the girl is a lefty, which has a certain influence over the amount of spin that can be applied on either side. A second permanent modifier for the game allows you to specify the weight of the ball, which has some effect on the ball movement. None are more difficult than the other, it's just a case of learning what the slight differences are. Don't think that it's something intuitive or clever. The alterations are basically arbitrary. Once the game starts, you position your character along the line, 
select your control, which is left or right spin, and then power. The ball travels down the lane with a decent animation, scattering the pins in a reasonable assimilation of physics. Nothing fancy here, but serviceable. And that's basically the whole experience right there. No nachos, no beer, no high-fiving your teammates and whooping obnoxiously. I suppose you could do that if you wanted. Hell, you don't even get a choice of garish monogrammed shirts. The hit detection is not spot on by any stretch. You can miss entirely and get a hit. Sometimes the ball ghosts straight through the mark. The music is nice, but there's no bowling sounds, which seems like such an obvious oversight. The satisfying clatter of marble on wood when you hit a strike just isn't there. Not even an attempt to emulate it was made. Maybe they tried but couldn't do it, so just gave up, but it feels pretty lazy. Strangely, for what is essentially a sports game, apparently bowling is a sport. Who knew? You aren't playing against an opponent. Instead, each of the countries you visit have a qualifying score to beat. The scores you need to achieve are way too high. You need to hit strikes most of the time, with the first level requiring a 200 score in Japan, increasing to 250 by the time you get to England, represented by the Union Jack, but that's a separate grievance. For a guy who can't hit much past 100 in actual bowling, trying to do this on a Game Boy where your success or failure is determined by nothing but timing to audio cues is damn near impossible. There's little incentive to progress anyway. All the alleys look the same apart from the national flags on the wall. No saves, no passwords, no continues. You need to beat all six games in one shot. Don't worry about it though, beat the last country and you get these strange men with parasols who remark, congratulations, you are good player. Cool, thanks. So glad I just sat through all that. In my experience, the best thing about bowling is the social aspect of it. Go into the alley with your mates, getting drunk, and laughing at the guy with no coordination who keeps guttering that thing. Missing your turn because you got bored and started playing on Metal Slug in the corner. Writing a name on the screen as ass and poo. You know, all those things we actually used to go bowling for. There's none of that in world bowling. And so really, is there any point? Really? Another one? The Game Boy wasn't even nine months old, and there'd already been three trap em up games. Well, okay, let's be fair, there were more cluttered categories by this point, but with a genre of such limited originality potential, did we really need this many? Originally released way back in 1979 for the PC-8000 by NEC, Heiankyo Alien was already pretty old by 1990. The name Heiankyo refers to the Heian period of historical Japan, and the story is that aliens have infested Kyoto. You can set traps for enemies which they may stumble into, proceed to then bury them, and once all on the screen are gone, you move to the next stage. If you wait too long, they climb out and can also be helped out by their kinsmen. If an enemy walks over a partially dug hole, it just fills in. There are two versions, old and new game. The old game is identical to the late 70s version and is pretty hard. The holes take ages to dig. It's pretty sparse looking, as you might expect, and the AI seems pretty non-existent. The new game looks a bit better, and the accompanying music has a nice melody and pace. This version is a lot more friendly too, and new players should get the gist quickly enough. The AI seems better, but you move and dig faster whereas the enemies dawdle along a bit more. There are 12 levels, 15 in the old version, which loop, with a more demanding time limit each time. Well, it's not really a time limit as such, but in Bubble Bobble style, if you wait too long, a ton more angry and fast aliens come at you, so don't hang about. The graphics in-game are fair to middling, nothing special. The death animation is pretty funny, actually. I need to ask, though, what the heck is that on the box art? It's truly disturbing and has to go down as some of the worst cover art ever. Heiankyo Alien is not as good as Boomer's Adventure in Asmic World, 
not as bad as the hideous Hyper Runner. Occasionally I think to myself that I need to learn to appreciate the trap em up genre, but then I look at my shelf at the hundreds of other titles I could be playing, and after a few fleeting seconds it passes. It is the year 2XXX, and Earth has been attacked by aliens from generic Planet X. Captain X of Intergalactic something something has been tasked to pilot the new X fighter starship and fly to the heart of X's civilization to destroy the evil X once and for all. You know this story, it's second only to the Rescue the Damsel platform adventure in terms of overused game cliché. Solar Striker seems like a strange name, seeing as you're not actually attacking a star of any kind. Instead, you're tasked with flying to and infiltrating the enemy planet, penetrating the core and destroying the head computer. Play the game on a Game Boy Color or Advance, and it looks great. The colors are inverted so that the background is black, you know, like what space is, and it's quite effective. In 1990, with the dot matrix, this wouldn't have worked, and wisely they didn't try. Instead, you have a white, or green, background, with the detail of stars, ships, and projectiles being darker. Everything is clear enough, and the screen blur is kept to a minimum, as is the flicker. Sadly, it seems this was achieved at the expense of actually putting things on the screen. The backgrounds are 95% blank, leaving you battling the alien hordes in a void. There are almost 20 different enemies that come at you in Solar Striker, not counting bosses, which is quite impressive. And like lots of Nintendo games from this era, they have stupid names, including, but not limited to, Pincher, Batwing, Mac, and my favourite, Twerk. Also available are power-up icons, which allow you to upgrade your pew-pew lasers three times. If you get shot down, you only get degraded once, rather than right back to scratch. That's your lot, though. No alternate or secondary weapons, no shields, nothing. One hit KO. The AI attack in swarms, a lot of which can be dealt with by hanging out front and centre of the screen and holding fire. The aliens will just fly into your stream. You should have very little trouble getting to the bosses. The enemies aren't quick, and projectiles are few and far between. The first handful of bosses are a piece of cake too, although the bosses of stage 4 and 5 are pretty tricky. And the ending boss is painfully underwhelming, both in appearance and difficulty. It has one attack that will take you a couple of lives to figure out, but then you can defeat it in around 30 seconds. Solar Striker suffers from bland music, and two, maybe three sound effects in the whole game. You're probably not going to want to play with headphones for this one. Overall, a decent, playable effort, but one that would be quickly overshadowed and never revisited. Like Super Mario Land, the game was safe. Certainly no boundaries were pushed here, but for a first foray into the shoot 'em up genre, the game is not completely horrible. It's bang average. Malkil will take the shape of the earth, wind, water, and fire. Farewell! The fate of the world is in your hands! Back, Fire Beast! Live the saga of Iron Sword on your Nintendo Entertainment System from a plane. Kuros? Thou hast discovered something most interesting. 
an early title, unreleased in Japan. Wizards and Warriors X is the first game in our library that was exclusively produced, developed, and released in Western areas. A sequel to Iron Sword, Wizards and Warriors 2 for the NES, you could be excused for wondering where chapters 4 through 9 are. Graphically, the Fortress of Fear is certainly reminiscent of its NES cousins. The protagonist Kuros is faithful, and the way the game looks is probably its biggest plus point. The graphics are quite nice for so early on, especially since this was the first real shot a Western developer had with the technology. However, the graphic style is also a detriment to the game. Trying to retain the sizes of the sprites from the NES trilogy on a proportionately smaller screen means everything is so close up that there's virtually no draw distance at all. Enemies and projectiles come upon you so quickly that until you've learnt the stage layouts, you'll be taking a lot of damage. Compare this to Castlevania or Super Mario Land, where characters were scaled down, sacrificing some of the look, but maintaining the all-important gameplay. As time went on, developers did find that sweet spot between playability and imagery, but it took a little while to get there. The Wizards and Warriors series was remarkable in part due to its omnidirectional exploration. Climbing up and down towers was just as prominent as were left to right sections. There's very little of that here. Levels progress horizontally with plenty of backtracking. The gameplay that we're used to in this series is largely replaced by an endurance course of projectiles painstakingly situated to damage you unless you're super quick. Respawning enemies, forced damage, and death traps. Throw into the equation a generous helping of awkward moving platforms and fall damage with massively overpowered enemies and bosses, and you've got one absolute tyrant of a game. Oh yeah, and there's no invulnerability period post-hit. You can lose all of your health before you've even been able to react to what's damaging you. No continues either, folks. It's a pretty harsh Taskmaster. There are plenty of hidden passages that are largely found by jumping above the screen and walking over the top of the walls. And if you want to get anywhere, then this is quite necessary, as often it's the only way to get extra lives. Sometimes, though, you want to go back and carry on with the level, only for it to end because you pass through some secret exit. Some levels end just as abruptly, only for you to be told that the evil Malkiel awaits to vent his wrath upon thee. When I first saw that, I thought it was cool that the story progressed after each level, but no, you get the same text after each one. Never mind my hopes and dreams then. I can't stress enough how much I wanted this game to be great. I really did. It's just so short of the mark in so many areas. minute to learn, a lifetime to master. Tragic is the existence that's forced to dedicate their lifetime to mastering Othello. Sakuda Original are a reasonably obscure development company more well known for toy production, who can be traced back long before the Game Boy. They licensed a version of the board game Reversi as far back as 1973 in Japan, and were the first company to tack on the name Othello, based very loosely on the Shakespeare work. Not much else came from these guys. They just really liked Reversi, I guess. Each player places either black or white discs on an 8x8 checkerboard, one at a time, so that one or more existing discs are bounded on either end of a straight line with your colour disc. All tiles in between your two discs can then be flipped over to your colour, with the objective being to have the most discs flipped to your colour once all 64 spaces have been filled, or until no more moves can be made. A very simple premise for a board game, but there are plenty of strategies and subtleties that you'll pick up on the more you play. As a human versus human game, this serves a way to pass a rainy afternoon round your grandparents' house, if you've watched that VHS of Tom and Jerry twice already, and the deck of cards only has 51 in it. Played against someone of a similar skill level, it could even be quite fun. 
but put yourself up against very early 90s AI, however, and it's a different story. The AI is far too tough to be accessible to the average player. You can seem to be doing alright, only for the opponent to stunlock you into repeatedly having no possible moves, while they quickly take over the whole board. Never yet have I won a round of Othello. There are several CPUs to choose from, but I don't think it makes a difference. They're all pretty solid. I'm perhaps mere prattle without practice, but I'm not about to dedicate a great deal of time to learning this. It's just not interesting enough as a concept. It's a good idea to put a time limit on, because the AI can sometimes take an eternity to come up with a move. Due to the almost endless number of placement possibilities, it's meaningless to plan more than a move or two ahead, so don't think you can use this time for strategy. The sound effects and music exist, but you'll probably wish they didn't. That tune is 12 seconds long, and it's not as if they were saving cart space for the vast amounts of programming that this thing must have taken. Surely a little variation would have been reasonable. Graphically, it's nothing pretty, but I suppose it doesn't have to be. The character faces, especially the human-controlled players, look pretty ridiculous. Perhaps it's because I'm not 8 or 80 years old, but I don't like this board game. The Game Boy rendition in and of itself is faithful, but I should rather drown cats and blind puppies. If you really want to play a board game on your Game Boy, there's Monopoly or even Scrabble, both of which are great fun. Hell, even Chess Master is decent enough. This one sucks. Apparently, there's a World Championship Othello event, if you can believe such a thing. Hurl my soul from heaven and fiends snatch at it, if life's not just too damn short. Ah, Konami. Wow, they were good in the 80s, weren't they? Well, alright, Nemesis was technically released in the 90s, but they were pretty great then, too. Forget the self-destructive bridge-burning that constitutes their current praxis, and be grateful for the fact that some of the most wonderful franchises of all time, certainly on Nintendo consoles, were given breath by the esteemed minds of Konami's old guard. Gradius is a series that certainly stands shoulder to shoulder with the other greats like Contra and Castlevania. Nemesis, largely based on Gradius on the NES, marks the first of Konami's iconic space shooters on the Game Boy, and it can proudly stand at the side of its bigger brothers, even outshining some of them. You probably already know the premise of this game. You control a spaceship with unlimited and upgradable weaponry, against a baffling and ever more powerful army of antagonists, which, upon death, can drop icons to collect. The traditional set of power-ups are there, speed increases, ground-seeking missiles, a double shot, lasers, option, which generates up to two invulnerable orbs of light that mimic your movements and attacks, and shields, which allow you to take a few hits before dissipating. Every seasoned Gradius player has their own techniques on which power-ups to prioritize. But in the early stages, there are so many drops to collect that you won't need to. Nevertheless, I find that you only need one speed boost. More than one can make movement a bit imprecise, in fact. After which, max out those ground missiles. There are lots of pesky enemies that live down there that are tough to hit without crashing into the scenery. Yeah, that happens here, I'm afraid. The static objects will kill you as much as the bad guys do at first. That's alright though, it instills precision in the player. After that's done, get those lasers going and get the two option orbs following you. Now all that's left is to get the shields up and play the dodge the drop game where you keep the greyed out F box highlighted to reactivate your shields as soon as you lose them. 
while trying to avoid picking up any further drops, causing the meter to annoyingly cycle to the start. There are two game difficulties. In option one, the enemies are often more like obstacles than aggressors, rarely firing at you. Most go down with one hit. No hitting the five stages is the order of the day here, and with a few tries you shouldn't have much problem at least getting to the last stage without losing a ship. If you do die on these later stages though, prepare to have your Vic Vipers handed to you. Your ship is gutted down to the bare bones, with little chance to get back to full strength. You can get to a certain point at full power without dying, only to lose all the lives you've accumulated because you can't reattain that strength. Shoot 'em up veterans should be used to this and know all too well the added pressure not to die that this creates. This is doubly pertinent if you try the harder difficulty. Get good in option one, really good, because if you're sadistic enough to try option two, you'll need to be. That secret level hidden halfway through stage two will look like the city of willows if you make it that far. If I have a notable problem with the game, it's that possibly the easy mode is too easy and the hard mode is just too hard. A middle setting would have been perfect for those who, like me, are by no means experts, but certainly not newcomers. After a left-right auto-scrolling level, complete with the traditional swarms of aliens, peri on like cell things, and the good old Cheerio spewing Moai heads, there's often a short endurance test before the boss fights. These cannot be beaten, but merely have to be survived. Towards the end of stage one, two volcanoes erupt violently, spewing rocks about the place. There are others where enemies encroach from all sides, needing to be destroyed for a predetermined time period. After these come the huge bosses. These look amazing, often taking up the whole screen. There's nothing you haven't seen before in a Gradius title. The pulsating cores pinpoint where you need to strike at them. The detail in these massive sprites is really impressive, and the destruction animations demonstrated one of the earliest examples of the layering techniques that artists used to push the minimalist technology to its fullest. The backgrounds are richly detailed too, and there's also one of the earliest uses of parallax scrolling on the system. There can be tons of sprites on screen, but you don't get a great deal of flicker, an admirable achievement. A wide variety of sounds are utilised, with some great sci-fi explosions and laser blasts. That glorious music isn't forgotten, and could well be the best music on the system up to this point. Listen with headphones to hear some trippy stereophonics, and a lovely low end that dispelled the notion that the Game Boy's sound bank was nothing more than a tinny, annoying little bleep machine. The composition really is that good. It and the sound effects complement each other well, without one dominating the other. A really accomplished audible work. There wasn't exactly an abundance of games in this genre on the Game Boy, but its strength lies in the quality of the titles that did come out. While later reviews will determine if Nemesis is the best shoot 'em up on the system, it's definitely the best up to where we are now, and indeed for a little while yet. Prime your trigger finger though. 1991 and 1992 were darn good years for what proved to be one of the Game Boy's strongest areas. What a time to be alive. Another variation of a two-player counters game, Taikyoku Renju could perhaps be most closely compared to Connect 4 or Noughts and Crosses. The title, to the best of my knowledge, translates as Connecting Pearls Game, which should give a rough idea of what's going on. Here the premise is very simple, connect five of your counters in a straight row, either horizontally, vertically or diagonally, somewhere on a 15x15 15 15 board. Unlike Connect 4, where you have to drop counters downwards, you can play a piece anywhere on the board, connected to others or not, so long as it's not a preoccupied space. You take it in turns placing a piece until either player has five in a row, or a hundred pieces have been placed. It seems like an incredibly simple concept, and it is, but like all the best board games, often the most straightforward rule sets lead to the most captivating of games. I enjoy the opening game idea you get with Renju. Player 1 must place two black counters and one white in a suitable opening pattern. 
The second player then gets to decide which colour they want to play as, based on this opening pattern. It takes away any conceived advantage of playing first, as well as adding an extra little flavour of strategy to the game. As well as this, playing as the black counters has a few other minor rule drawbacks, such as not being able to create two groups of three at any one time. As you'd expect, there are plenty of tricks and manoeuvres you can figure out along your way. A fun game to play against another human, or one of the three CPU difficulties. Also, there are preset layouts that throw you into the midst of an ongoing game. It's lovely when you don't need a rulebook to learn something, especially when it's a Japanese exclusive, although if you did feel like actually reading the game, you can. This marks the first example of a Game Boy game where you can choose the language at the start. Sure, there's minimal translation needed, but it's a nice gesture all the same. You can choose from four different songs as your in-game music, which again is an appreciated gesture, but you'll probably get tired of all of them in short order. The sound doesn't add anything here, but it's not needed. Taikyoku Renju is as simplistic as it gets, while remaining a pretty good way of killing half an hour. Recommended import. Let's give this another try, shall we? Sports games are often hit and miss on 8-bit systems, and the Game Boy seems to house a lot of poor ones. At least, off the top of my head, I can think of more strikeouts than home runs. But that's one of the aims of this book, to give these things due time and attention to see if my initial prejudices are fair and or accurate. After the shocking mess that was Nintendo's baseball, we have another NES port, Bases Loaded. Similarly, you can choose USA or Japan mode, the only discernible difference being the names of your players. A marked improvement that you'll notice straight away is the pace of the game. The ball and fielders move at a more realistic pace, and it's actually possible to catch a hitter out by using skill. Crazy concept, right? Once a fielder has it, throwing to your base of choice is intuitive. Treat the bases as cardinal directions. First is right, second up, and so on. Press that direction and hit A, and the fielder will attempt to throw to the guy on that base. It's a reasonable way of getting someone out, which is what you want to be able to do in baseball. Seems like a daft point to make, but remember, I've just played baseball, so I can't take these things for granted. When pitching, you get to see from the pitcher's point of view, and it doesn't look horrible. You can put various spins on the throw, away or towards the batsman. There's a weird corkscrew shot that the computer does sometimes, but I've not worked out how to emulate that. It's hard to hit, and a nailed on strike. Managing to strike the ball is not so much skill or planning, but being able to hit that timing sweet spot. You'll figure out what that is. You can also bunt the ball, plus one for actual sports research, where you hold the bat out in front of you for a guaranteed hit. The ball will just land in front of your batsman, leaving the fielders no time to throw to a base before your teammates can run on one. It's a good way to get players round if you're running low on strikes. Bases loaded is a much better attempt at baseball, for sure. But if there's a complaint, it's that it's still too hard. The graphics are nice enough, but the sound is too generic and a little grating. It's a fun game that you can actually play and get into. The tension of trying to reach the base before the ball is definitely there, which, at its most base, sorry, is what you want from a baseball game. Really good effort. I have to address the elephant in the room. It would be remiss of me to leave this out of the review. When the fielders get the ball, what are they doing? It can only be one thing, and it's indecent. Graphics point off for being disgusting, but comedy point on for at least being synchronised.
Block puzzle games are certainly not in short supply on the Game Boy, and not without reason. A great one doesn't need to look flash or sound amazing, but can be simple one-screen affairs with straightforward rule sets and head-scratching strategy. In Flipple, you control a teardrop-shaped blob thing that throws out different blocks at a pile of other blocks, in order to try to clear a certain number of them out. There are four designs on the blocks which need to be matched to the one you're throwing. You cast each one horizontally, and any matching blocks in consecutive order will be removed, and the next different block will fly into your character's hands to be your next move. It's sometimes possible to drop blocks vertically depending on the shape of the ceiling, which allows you to clear vertical lines instead. The levels are all based in a 12 by 12 grid, with different arrangements of indestructible blocks to rebound off. The rest of the screen shows you the maximum number of blocks that you can have left when all possible moves have gone, as well as how many are left. There's also a score and a pretty generous time limit. Well, it depends how much thought you want to put into your sequence of moves. If you try to think three or four steps ahead, which is harder than it sounds until you get used to how blocks are removed, then three or so minutes per stage can get pretty tight. Often you'll be left with no visible blocks of the same design to the one you're holding. If this happens, you have a limited amount of super blocks that can remove anything. Use these wisely though, as they're hard to come by, and if you have no available moves or S blocks, it's game over. There are a small handful of continues, and no password system or save. This is a big problem with the game, it's not easy by any means, and layouts are random, so you can't even learn the stages. This does increase replayability, but with 50 levels, you're going to have to focus for a long period of time to beat Flipple. It's one of those that you're going to have to sink your teeth into in order to get very far. Knowing when to go for the big combos and when to knock out single cubes is essential to grasp. And which cubes to leave alone, generally it's best not to take out the bottom row from above, as that leaves you with no remaining moves. You can keep going back to this time and again. The sound isn't too annoying, and the graphics don't get in the way, they do the job. It's really lacking a save feature, but that's pretty much the game's only flaw. The name is pretty stupid, I suppose, and the artwork, if you can call it that, has nothing to do with the game. The blurb on the back of the box actually says, gnarliest. It occurs to me how strange it is to see that word in print, ensuring you'll have no danger in mistaking when this game was released. Tetris showed us how the most rudimentary of concepts can create a timeless masterpiece that transcends generations. I wouldn't say for a second that Flipple, an exciting cube game, falls into that latter category, but it holds its own in the genre, surpassing a lot of its competition. Tough, infuriating, captivating. All these things from the simplest concept you could imagine. Well done, Taito. Pick two games, any two games, at random. Now try to imagine what the mongrel offspring of those two games would play like. Quoth is kind of like a cross between Tetris and Space Invaders. Sold yet? Well, allow me to elaborate. You have a playfield with a little ship at the bottom that fires blocks at constantly encroaching shapes. These shapes are made up of the blocks that you're firing, and it's your job to create filled-in quadrilaterals from them. For example, if you have a U-shape coming towards you, shoot in between the two sides of the U until the middle fills in, making a perfect rectangle. The shape will then vanish, giving you a point for each constituent block. You can, of course, add more blocks to it, making the quadrilateral larger and giving you more points. 
If the shapes reach the bottom, however, you die. This won't happen to you at the lower difficulties because the movement is so slow. Try it on level 9 though, and it's a different story. There's a countdown score that you need to attain by the end of the level. After you get it down to zero, it starts counting up, with every point thereafter being worth more than one once the level ends. The layouts are predetermined, kind of like a music scroll on a self-playing piano, but by adding more blocks to it, you can boost your score higher. Choose the random option at the start if this doesn't appeal to you. You can choose between six ships at the start of the game, but it makes no difference save a visual one. They all look pretty silly. There are various power-ups that you're given if you clear big enough groups of blocks, and these sit in a designated area on the right of the screen. You cycle through them with down on the D-pad. There's a lightning bolt that clears the entire screen, which is best saved for emergencies. There is a square with lines under it. This temporarily increases your shot speed. The music is pretty dull, and visually it does what it needs to. It's not important to blow you away in these departments, and the controls are tight and responsive, making Quarth an enjoyable enough experience. You can fire blocks quickly and accurately by counting off the button presses, and they always go where you intend. If you screw this one up, it's probably your own fault. You may have heard of a console called the NES. It was apparently moderately successful in some parts of the world. If you grew up stateside in the 1980s or early 90s, then you will undoubtedly be acquainted with the original 8-bit home console from Nintendo. However, over in Europe, we were arguably more at home with Sega's Master System. The video game market didn't suffer from the same chokehold that Nintendo had in North America, and the variety was much richer for it. As a result, Penguin Land, or Doki Doki Penguin Land, may well be more familiar to European listeners. I remember this cute little platform puzzler as a kid. What I didn't know was this adventure was actually available on the Game Boy, if you were lucky enough to live in Japan. You play as, obviously, a penguin who is tasked with rescuing these three penguin eggs that have been lost on an alien planet. You don't have to search for them, rather, your job is to guide the eggs down to the bottom of these icy caverns without breaking them. There are various obstacles that are stopping you from doing this, such as polar bears that try to smash them, but you're not completely powerless. There are pushable blocks that can crush them. Transporting the egg is intuitive, you can dig through certain blocks with the B button, but be aware that the eggs can only fall a certain height, three tile spaces, before splattering on the ground. You yourself can jump on the egg, but only if it can squeeze out from under you, else you crush it. If you're too slow, a bird comes to try to steal the egg. There are 25 levels in the Game Boy version of Penguin Land, of which you can choose your starting stage. Many aspects of this port are faithful to the original. It looks nice despite the lack of the vibrant colours, and everything is clear. The music is well composed and catchy. However, we have one big shortcoming to contend with. The original scrolls vertically, as you might expect, seeing as you're navigating down a cavern. However, on the Master System, the entire width of the screen was static. It was all on one screen. Here, the screen is essentially two full widths wide. This would only be a minor hindrance, except that when you cross that imaginary central line, the whole game pauses so that it can scroll, if you're trying to manoeuvre down that middle part of the level, the screen will flick left and right all the time, completely killing any rhythm you might work up. And this happens vertically as well. You're constantly waiting for the game to catch up to your movements. Unfortunately, not a successful way to compensate for screen blur. I may be biased at times to the Game Boy, but I'm the first to comment on the limitations. 
although I don't think the hardware was the problem here. It's such a simple game visually, it would surely have been possible to port a suitable version of Penguin Land to the Game Boy. Overall, a decent effort let down by one programming oversight. The Game Boy version is alright, but Penguin Land is better experienced on the SMS. Remember Flappy Bird? The Why Is This a Phenomenon in 2014 app for mobile devices was a pretty huge deal for some reason. Thankfully, this is nothing to do with that. Flappy, or Floppy, oh dear, is a series of largely Japan exclusive games by developer DBSoft in the Eggerland vein. It featured on several home computers in the early to mid 80s but lay somewhat dormant for at least five years until this port came out. There are 160 levels. That's a lot of game, but there's a simple four-character password and unlimited continues to help get you through. The aim of each stage is to push a particular flashing rock onto a flashing platform. You do so by filling holes and crushing or otherwise circumventing obstacles such as gaps and enemies. Often you need to push blocks halfway across other ones to create a kind of bridge that allows you to transport the important block to otherwise unreachable places. The rocks respond to gravity, but Flappy doesn't. You can flap, I guess, back up. This doesn't make a lot of sense, seeing as how Flappy is actually a mole, not a bird. But I'm not here to justify physics in a cartoon video game. Hell, I'm still trying to work out why a mole would care about rolling a flashing boulder onto a plinth. I guess it's about as purposeful as pushing crates onto designated squares in a warehouse. More on that again shortly. You can only push rocks, you can't pull, so be wary of getting them stuck in corners. Occasionally you can collect a mushroom. There are enemies walking around that you can make sleep by hurling the mushrooms at them. This can stop them hurting you, or allow you to use them as a platform to help solve a puzzle. I think there are only two enemies, a crab thing and something that looks like a chick. Chickens are born underground, didn't you know that? The music is chirpy and kind of sweet, and fits the cartoonish feel of the game, although the game does lose out for not using any decent sound effects. Graphically though, everything is cramped. It doesn't need to be, as the brick borders fill at least half the screen. To waste that much space on such a minuscule screen is criminal. Any charm or detail is greatly compromised, which is why the very few things to see in Flappy Special are basically indistinguishable. The most charming thing in the game comes when you beat a level. Flappy walks across the screen and bows to you, saying, Congratulation. There might be a storyline. It's probably something to do with saving some planet from some evil, all-powerful overlord which inexplicably has well-organized boulders as its kryptonite, but it probably doesn't matter. Anyway, Flappy Special goes into the well-populated but nonetheless healthy category of puzzle Game Boy game, and it's not bad at all. Looks aren't everything, and I'll probably never finish it, it's such a long game. You'll probably have to import it, but it shouldn't be too expensive, it's a common game in Japan. Give it a go. Gundam is one of those franchises that I sort of know, but don't, if you know what I mean. 
It's famous enough that the name, if nothing else, has made it out of Japan. If you gave me a pen and paper and told me to write down everything I know about it, I'd perhaps get two bullet points out at most. I know it's an anime, and I know it's something to do with fighting robots. Actually, I could add a third thing to this list. There were a chunk of Game Boy games devoted to it. I never actually played any of them as they were Japan only, and kind of inaccessible unless you could read the text. The first on the list roughly translates to the story of a country thief in the Sengoku period of Japanese history, which doesn't really tally up with what I know about Gundam. It turns out the SD stands for Super Deformed, and it's kind of a Gundam spin-off, whereby the characters are anthropomorphized and put into more real storylines in some horrific parody slash fanfiction that did not encourage me to delve further. Hey, I knew when I was starting this project that parts of it were going to be hard work that needed to be ploughed through, and so it proved here. This is an interesting concept on the surface of it, half strategy, half side view fighting sequences. However, both parts of the game have massive, and I mean massive, pitfalls that really damage this to the point where it's not even a game. The overhead view makes no sense, there are all of these flags that encroach you, but it's not turn-based, it just happens. You can move a cursor around the grid, but none of the buttons seem to do anything. Allegedly, this is where the strategy comes in, but instead of a war simulator, it's more of a mill about until they get to you simulator. Eventually, when enough of the, I guess, enemy flags cover the map, you'll come into contact with an opponent and get thrown into the action bits. If the map scenes are confusing, the action-y bits are nigh unplayable. I sort of see what was being aimed at here, but it's as if the game plays at 200% speed. This might have simply been a frame rate oversight, but surely this gets picked up in testing, right? Even the timer counts down way faster than seconds do. You and the opposing mech are bouncing around what looks like a temple or a museum, or sometimes the countryside, flinging swords around. The enemy isn't on the same screen as you most of the time, and when it is, you both move way too fast, so good luck even making contact. I don't mind the graphics, it seems like this was the only area of the game where any effort was applied. The characters look cool, and the close-ups are well drawn. It's a pity the graphics weren't used correctly for anything resembling a game. The music, if it can be called as such, is absolute garbage. Only a couple of the channels seem to be used for music, the others are taken up by some horrific low droning that at first made me think my earphones were packing up. But no, the ROM version does the same thing. I've translated the title as well as I can, but any combination of syllables I can stitch together have no correlation with anything you'll find in the game. At the time of recording, no actual fan translations have been made. That's not to say one wasn't started, but the level of saintly patience needed to finish can't possibly exist in one person. My Japanese and programming knowledge is too low for me to do it, thank god. This might be the worst game in the library so far. Master Karataka and Hyper Load Runner were pretty shocking, and this is definitely down there. Wanna know something even worse? There were two sequels to this. Plow through it, isn't it? This is a collection of various card games, none of which are massively compelling. You can play Daifugo, which translates as Grand Millionaire, Speed, and Nervous Breakdown. 
The object of Daifugo is to get rid of all the cards you have as fast as possible, by playing progressively stronger cards than those put down by the previous player. Typically, players will do this by throwing away their weaker cards first, but there are strategies available to screw over your opponents, which gives this game its other title, Asshole. It's designed for five players, meaning, while you can play with a link cable, ultimately the majority of the opposition will be CPU, and that brings all the scummy nonsense that comes with trying to program AI to play a game of chance. Let's just say, you probably won't win this one. Speed is not dissimilar, in that the object is to discard your entire hand. Now though, it's quicker. You need to play cards that are one higher, one lower, or the same as one of the two piles in the centre. Once you go below five cards, you have to take more into your hand until the deck is depleted. Nervous Breakdown. In my house we called this Concentration or something like that. All 52 cards are laid face down in a grid, and the idea is to pick two at random to make pairs. If they match, you win them. If they don't, you put them back where you got them. At the end, the winner is the one with the most cards. You know what I'm gonna say, don't play this against the CPU. Clearly it was beyond the programmer to write a fairness module for this. Whether you've uncovered potential pairs or not, the computer player will pull matches out of its arse. It doesn't even give you a sliver of a chance. For two players, this might be a little fairer, but by the time you untangled your link cable and got the two Game Boys set up, you could have laid out a real deck of cards and done this. Or, ideally, something else. No time was wasted making the game look flashy either. The design of the cards is bog standard, and there's nothing else accompanying it. The music is a rather naff collection of classics featuring the entertainer. And it's not for lack of skill in either of those departments. Remember, this is the same company who made Battleship early on, and I've already opined as to how gorgeous that game looks and sounds. Trump Boy is one of those little nuggets, I'm talking about the ones that won't flush rather than the golden ones, that exist for no apparent reason other than somebody had to code it to meet a deadline or something. There's not a great deal of information on this game on the internet, and unfortunately the title prompts some less than savoury search results. And I'm not even talking porn here. Do you hate animals? Want to throw balls at them without risk of reprimands from the RSPCA? Well then, do I have the game for you. Known as King of the Zoo in Europe, Penguin Wars is essentially dodgeball for our furry friends. There's a table with you at one end and your opponent at the other. You each start with five balls and for a total of one minute proceed to hurl them at each other. At the end of the time limit, the one who's been hit the most loses. You move left and right and use A to pick up and then throw the ball. After you do, the ball is then in the hands, or whatever, of the opponent to return. A hit will cause the creature to be stunned for a little while. You can hold the button to charge up your throws, which leave them flawed for longer. Hitting your opponent gives you points, but it's also possible to win by clearing your side of balls. This is possible by stunning the other animal, and then stun-locking them by repeatedly peppering shots at them, not letting them rise. Pretty brutal stuff. You choose between a penguin, a bat, a rabbit, a rat, or a cow, all of whom are just adorable looking. They all play slightly differently. The cow is slow, but can really power those throws, whereas the bat is quick, but weak. You can block shots by hurling a ball of your own back at it, the collision physics are pretty accurate. If the game is a tie at the end of the 60 seconds, this drunk character comes out to try to interfere. I've seen that all the time at the football, and clearly animal dodgeball is no more civilised than a Saturday afternoon down at Ellen Road. 
there's not a great deal of depth to the game. You're being violent to animals, so there probably wasn't many places to go, but it's an amusing game that is well drawn and sounds great. Well, the music sounds good, as do most of the sound effects. There are one or two somewhat ear-piercing whistles that are a little too shrill. The characters have just the right amount of anthropomorphic charm and look pretty funny when you manage to hit them. It's not a challenge to beat, and it really won't take you long. You'll have fun doing it though, so indulge your violent side by all means. Just make sure you do it in Penguin Wars. Leave your pets alone. Everyone knows what Space Invaders is. Iconic doesn't begin to describe the impact and influence of those two words. It's been put onto everything. The Game Boy port is decent. It plays like every version of the game you've ever played. There are the same four shields, although the size of the screen is accommodated for by reducing the columns of enemies from 11 to 8. Modifying the original to fit the Game Boy was done well. The colours are inverted, which was also a good idea. The aliens are black on a lighter background. You can see everything well, and the game is as fun as any other version I've played. You get three lives to kick off with, an extra one at 1500 points, and that's it. This is old school arcade, and it didn't try to hide the fact. This was released in 1990, and only came out in Japan. For a game with such a universal appeal, this exclusivity seemed on the surface to be a curious business decision. However, all would become clear towards the end of 1994. The North American and European versions of this cartridge were launched to utilise the newly released Super Game Boy SNES adapter. The Super Game Boy allowed Game Boy games to be played on your TV and changed the palette from grayscale to colourised. It also made the games way easier to see. Remember, in 1994 the only option was the spinach screen with all that blur. In addition to this, various games were given other enhancements, such as border designs. Playing the Game Boy version in this way gives you this arcade cabinet mock-up, which also reverts the colour scheme, simulating the coin-op version, and it's surprisingly effective. Where Space Invaders for the Game Boy truly shines, however, is the second game mode that appears when you use the Super Game Boy adapter. The cartridge has, inside, a copy of the Super Nintendo version of the game inside a Game Boy cartridge. I've played the Super Nintendo version and it is identical. This was pretty amazing. Impressive for that alone. It looks, sounds and plays amazingly when you consider it's a Game Boy game. It does kind of feel like cheating, as you can't get these results on the actual hardware. And the scores I've given it take this into account. Major credit for innovation though. Every serious video game collector of any description should probably have a copy of Space Invaders in one of its million forms. I'm looking no further than this one. Thirty years may seem like an eternity, and the games of the generation dusty old relics. 
Imagine then porting a game that was already in its antiquity in 1990. There was plenty of pre-90s retro on the Game Boy, but you'd be hard-pressed to go back any further than the reimagining of the 1976 title, Blockade. Just as a reference point, that's the same year as Hotel California, or the first Rocky film. Yeah, we're going back some here. Serpent is kind of the same concept as Snake, but instead of battling against your own ever-expanding reptilian form, you, the Alpha Force, inhabit a field with an opponent. The idea here is to somehow trap the other snake, the Beta Force, in the same way that you die in the traditional version. While you're tangling yourselves up, they spawn about the level, randomly but always inside a closed loop, a number of pickups that keep things lively. Some allow you to expand your own snake for a time, which is great for going on the offensive, but be aware that you'll find it harder to slither your way out of any predicament. You can shrink your snake too, which may at first seem counterintuitive, but is actually safer. Somewhat odder are the missiles you can equip. I forgot to mention, the snakes are actually robot machines piloted by spacemen from the future, because real snakes with rocket launchers would just be silly. These kind of, but not really, seek out the other snake, making them speed up or slow down. Similar to your ability to change size, one is not necessarily better than the other, it depends how you're playing. You don't immediately die on contact with a wall or tail, instead you get a grace period in which you need to hope that your opponent lets you out, else you explode. Slowing your opponent down with the missiles makes it easier to catch them, but harder to keep them caught as they take longer to die. This whole thing is not some intergalactic war for domination of the universe or anything like that. No, it's a sport. Basically, each match consists of 13 frames, of which the first to win 7 is crowned Champion of Serpents, whereas the loser cries with the bitter taste of defeat. Each time a round is finished, there's a short animation of your snake celebrating the explosion of its enemy or looking disconsolate. I have won the war, it so gallantly exclaims. Serious business, this. The music is very cool and goes on for a long time before looping. There are some interesting time signatures in here, and the percussion track has a nice rhythm to it. I don't mind the way it looks either. Sticking somewhat safe and clutter-free allows you to focus solely on your tactics. One interesting point to note about Serpent, this game marks one of the first uses of the overlapping technique whereby two different screens flicker in and out in alternating frames, giving a kind of translucent effect. If you let the opening screen roll for a short while, you can see a demo of the game with the title overlaid on it. A simple use of the technique, sure, but a nice one. Some of the nicest graphics on the Game Boy were achieved using this method, as we'll see later on. It only works properly on DMG and Pocket consoles though, so if you're emulating, apologies. The controls may take a little figuring out. You can move in the cardinal directions, but obviously you can only turn through right angles, and only if there are available spaces. Turning left and right doesn't utilise the left and right arrows as you might expect, nor do you use the north, south, east and west configuration that also could have been chosen. In fact, you turn 90 degrees anti-clockwise by pushing left, and 90 degrees clockwise by pushing A. Strange as this might seem at first, it allows for that little bit quicker movement on your part, as you aren't restricting your movements to just one thumb. Imagine trying to control both flippers in a pinball game using just the D-pad, and you'll understand what I mean. The developers could have just gone with the immediately obvious controls, but instead were more pragmatic, and made a good design choice. Sure, you need to switch to the B button to fire your missiles, but seeing as 95% of your strategy comes from movement, this is no big deal. So, it's Snake, but then again, it's not. It's probably closer to the movie Tron, except it probably aged better. What it is for sure is a peculiar, clever little time waster that is, as you might figure, most fun when played against a friend. It's the sort of thing that older kids would love tormenting their younger siblings with. Firstborns are cruel like that.
put together the words Batman and Sunsoft and it conjures up images of a shady, dystopian Gotham City with that iconic purple protagonist. One of the sickest looking NES games of the time was the original Batman title. The minimalistic black backgrounds coupled with the gorgeous, colourful foregrounds made for a real treat back in the late 80s. All the while, one of the greatest 8-bit soundtracks of all time thrashed its way along. The game was amazing in every way, with lovely wall-jumping mechanics and just the right amount of God damn it, it's so hardness. It's for sure in my top three NES titles, along with Contra and Dracula's Curse. So imagine my excitement when I finally got around to playing the Game Boy version. It's got the same name, it's made by the same people. What could go wrong? I mentioned the NES soundtrack being cracking. It utilised extra channels which really beefed up the drums. The Game Boy version is pretty good too, I have to say, although I would have loved to hear the NES songs reprogrammed instead as they're so iconic. It's undeniably a Sunsoft soundtrack though. They were second only to Konami in terms of compositional brilliance for me. But then, when you start playing, you immediately realise it's far from the same game. There are no wall jumps, no punching. Batman actually shoots his enemies as his primary assault, which sits strangely with me for some reason. I thought the whole anti-hero idea was that Batman didn't kill people unless necessary. The biggest problem with this title is its overall look. It suffers from the same issue as Super Mario Land. The characters are far too small, leaving a huge proportion of the screen empty. Batman jumps at the same sort of ratio to Mario, something like three times his own height. There are random blocks hanging around in the air, some of which are darker than others. These hold an assortment of power-ups. Some make you shoot through walls, one gives you a batarang, which is pretty effective. Several of the icons do daft things, like reduce your shots to a pointlessly impotent range, and one that gives you a sinusoidal wave gun, which is basically impossible to use. You need to learn pretty quickly what stupid weapon upgrades to avoid. The backgrounds are pretty stark, but there are some very nice visual effects at the start of each level, which could have been found in some sort of tech demo. It's all very pretty, but constitute man hours that could have been spent making the sprites more impressive. The Joker towers over Batman, despite them being of a height in the film that the game is supposedly based on. The side-scrolling level towards the end is an annoying contrivance, tacked on to add artificial difficulty to what are otherwise painfully dull levels. It's the same concept as before, except now the screen's moving. There are two pretty decent stages just before this that have you piloting the Batwing in some pretty cool shoot-em-up action. Compared to something like Gradius, it's nothing, of course, but does break up the monotony of the main game, and it's the most fun you'll have the whole game. When writing the final two bosses, the devs ran out of either time or effort, as they're complete bullet sponges and are a real anti-climax. Batman is cool, but Batman is not. Fortunately, we'd get three more goes at the franchise before the Game Boy library was finished. The first iteration suffers from a sad lack of detail and is irritatingly underwhelming. What went wrong, Sunsoft? That's not like you.
With a name like Professor Rogue, no one could have been surprised when the notoriously evil scientist created a special fortress high above the Earth's beautiful capital city, Trillillium. It's near Northampton, I think, and filled it with robots. Fortunately, two agents of peace, the brother Warrior and Fighter, are sent from the Federation to destroy the eponymous fortress. But wait. Rogue captures the pair's beautiful, charming, and proud mother, Natasha. Well, that's annoying. Anyway, any parent who calls her sons warrior and fighter, and who isn't a gladiator, needs locking up. Nevertheless, I suppose we'd better try and rescue her. Mental storylines and unrelated box art aside, here is yet another action puzzle game. There were a lot of these early on, and inevitably a lot of them were unremarkable. Cyraid is a single-screen puzzler, where the goal of each stage is to break open all of the energy blocks and collect the capsules that fall out from them. There are usually four to six of these, and they can be destroyed from any side. The idea is that these energy capsules constitute the power source for all the enemies in the room. Collecting all of them terminates the enemies, allowing you to move to the next stage. There are plenty of pickups. Some speed you up or slow you down, and the most important ones are these Powertron blocks, which allow you to destroy previously untouchable blocks, jump, and even fire a gun. If you die, however, you're pushed right back to the basic character. Some later levels cannot be beaten unless you can jump, and the final boss can't be beaten unless you've got the gun. That's something interesting for a puzzle platformer game. These boss fights, which you'd perhaps not expect in a game like this, and they're quite inventive. While you can't directly attack them, you can drop or push blocks onto them. You can temporarily destroy enemies by kicking blocks or ladders into them, or by shifting a ladder while the enemy is on it. They'll respawn, but you'll need to take them out sometimes. Touching any of the enemies is death, but avoiding them is only half the challenge. Figuring out how to get all of the blocks is trickier than it appears at first. Removing the blocks or combining ladders can leave you unable to complete a level, but you can restart by pressing B, then select. This costs a life, but there are plenty around the levels to replenish your chances. The graphics are a little cramped, but not so it hampers gameplay, and it does allow for single screen levels. The music is well put together, but you may recognise it from Indiana Jones. It's a shameless imitation, let's be honest. Cyraid is a clever and unique little title that will command your attention. You probably won't want to play through the whole thing in one go, but password saves mean you don't have to. Something I forgot to mention, but is as cool as it is bizarre. Every so often a wall will disappear and a giant cookie thing will stomp its way in, shaking the whole screen and randomly rematerializing some of the blocks that you may have got rid of. The music changes to some real ominous song that fits the nightmare fuel that is being stomped to death by oversized baked goods. As it happens, it's not a cookie, but according to the manual, a donut hole monster whose body is, and I quote, as hard as a very stale donut hole. The manual is a great little read, actually, and the child in me appreciates the flipbook animation. Everything about the game is delightfully weird. Before genres were fully established, video games came in plenty of weird shapes and sizes. Most have obviously been replicated or improved upon, but one title that to this day remains inimitable was Taito's 1981 arcade title, Kix. You have a field of play roughly the size of the screen, and a small kind of diamond thing that you can move around the outside of the grid, along the predetermined lines. The aim is to fill a certain percentage of the screen by drawing tracks across the playfield using this diamond. Trying to stop you doing this is the kicks, a weird energy pulse that bounces around the field in whatever space there remains. You're only vulnerable to the kicks while you're adventuring across the field. If it touches you or any part of the line you're drawing, you die. Get to the other side, and the area you've just drawn will fill in, and you can now use these new edges as tracks to start drawing from. I always imagine that when you're on the edges, you've completed a circuit of some kind and are grounded or electrically neutral, 
but when venturing out there's a build-up of charge that attracts the kicks to you, and the aim is not to annihilate by coming into contact. Indeed, the kicks is kind of attracted to you, it doesn't just bounce around randomly. Hey, that's just the way my brain tries to make sense of this game. Anyway, there are two numbers at the top of the screen. The first is the percentage you need to beat the level, and the second is your current percentage. It's possible to exceed the aim, of course. This garners bigger bonuses, and Kix is one of those classic arcade-style games where it's all about getting your initials on that high scoreboard. There are plenty of other ways to boost your score too. The bigger shape you try to pull off, the higher your score, although obviously there's a risk-reward consideration to be made. There are two ways to initiate movement as well. Press the A button in a direction and you'll draw a fast line, leaving a lightly shaded box behind. However, press B instead and you'll move much slower, but if you make it, you leave a darker box. These give you massive amounts of points, so take the risk if you're brave enough. Sometimes there are more than one kicks on the screen, and if you can isolate them from each other, you get what's called a split kicks bonus for the following level. There is a bonus time limit, and also, you're not completely safe on the tracks. You're safe from the kicks, yes, but there are also sparks that trundle slowly around that look almost like a fuse burning down. These are death on contact as well. Now, it ain't a pretty game. It never was, but the Game Boy version looks totally spartan and sounds pretty foul. The kicks themselves are just a series of undulating straight lines in a sort of pulse shape, which can occasionally be hard to interpret. I'm not sure how else it could have been done, but still, it leaves a bit to be desired. It wouldn't be an early Nintendo-published Game Boy game without some interludes featuring various mascots, including Mario wearing a sombrero, playing a guitar to a vulture on a cactus. Kix is a unique title, and this is a decent version of it. It's a game I would consider proper old school. I know the Game Boy is now over 30 years old, I'm still trying to get my head around that, but Kix is from a generation long before even that. Younger players might not get the appeal. Imagine my dread seeing those two letters. With that horrific Gundam mess fresh in the memory, I approached this one with serious trepidation. Luckily, my fears were unwarranted, as SD Lupin Sansei is actually based off a completely different anime. Lupin the Third is a manga series based on the character Arsène Lupin the Third, the gentleman thief from Maurice Leblanc's series of novels. It has been described rather aptly as James Bond meets Charlie's Angels with Scooby-Doo sensibilities, and I couldn't be happier with the picture this paints. This was not the first game based on this intellectual property. There was an arcade cab released in 1980, as well as a Famicom title. I do enjoy the mammoth names that a lot of games were given in Japan, sometimes in two or three parts. Sometimes these long-winded Japanese titles translate into bizarre phrases unrelated to the game. Kinko Yabori Daisakusen basically means safe-cracking operation, which is shockingly accurate. Sansei means the third, as in Lupin the third, and that's who you're playing as here. There are various floors on each level, and your job is to find a key that will open a safe. Do that, and you keep the millions of dollars stored inside. There are detectives and police wandering around on your case, and you need to avoid contact with them, which is instant death. There will be somewhere on each floor a small box. Hold B while standing on it to completely detonate that floor and jump down to the next one. Pretty violent, eh? Also, you can find cell phones which call a sharpshooter guy to come help you. He also walks around the level shooting at your enemies for you. A four-way arrow destroys tiles in the cardinal directions for a moment, killing any enemy that happens to be standing on them. Holding B to jump up and down on an empty tile can raise it up two spaces allowing you to jump off and clear gaps that you otherwise couldn't make. 
as well as providing you with a safe space that ordinary enemies can't reach you on. You might also find these rotating arrows. These will cart you off in the direction the arrow is pointing when you step on it, invariably into a pit, usually best avoided. The controls are reasonably responsive, an all too common occurrence with games like this is where your inputs get swallowed, leading to a cheap death. Typically any life loss is fair, although the one aspect that potentially was a little harsh is the time limit. All flaws in a level need to be completed in the same period with no replenishments, and it demands constant movement. Any dalliance will no doubt result in you running out at some point. It perhaps could be seen as a little lazy that the game takes place on these nondescript floating tiles instead of an actual decorated world. It helps to emphasise the gameplay mechanics, but I can't help but feel that some graphical titivation would have gone a long way in making this game more memorable. As it is, SD Lupin Sensei is a slightly above average puzzle platformer that could be worth it for a fan of the series. They did expand beyond the puzzle game genre on the Game Boy, I promise. It was a simple format to program for, and short, level-based progression lent itself well to the portable nature of the system. Those exact motivations created a handful of classics, but also a plethora of half-arsed, dishwater clones of better titles. Another Japan exclusive, Bloodier is a puzzle action title that is almost a replica of earlier titles Pipe Mania and Locomotion. Here, instead of water or a train, concepts that vaguely make sense at a push, you are trying to take care of a little ball guy who needs to walk through each tile on the screen and jump off the end of the pipe. Once they are traversed, they disappear. If he steps on all the tiles, his parachute opens and he lands safely. If he doesn't, he angrily hits the ground and flips you the stone cold salute. The name Bloodier comes from another game called Diablo, not that one, that the game was based on. It was released on the Sharp X68000 as well as the TurboGrafx-16 as Time Ball. Rather than placing pieces here, you actually control the empty tile, moving the others into it like one of those jumble slide puzzles. On some levels, you need to wait until certain tiles have been passed in order to get your blank space out of an otherwise closed off loop. Lots of levels need tiles to be moved while the ball is on it, so rather than being a race to assemble the route, more timing and planning is needed. Bear in mind too that the ball can go off one edge of the grid and pop back out the other side. Some lateral thinking is required to beat some tables. There are a hundred stages and a level creator. Why on earth anyone would be interested in creating custom levels for this, I'm not sure, but it's there all the same. The gameplay is good enough for what it is, but there's very little attraction to keep you going throughout the whole thing. There's no music in Bloodier, and oh how it needed some. You get this atrocious bleep bloop thing that really wasn't good enough for 1990. It's titles like this that make the Game Boy seem like such a weak piece of kit when it really wasn't. Compare a game like this to a game like Nemesis and you'll see just how good a game can look and sound on the Game Boy. Not nearly enough effort was put into making Bloody look half decent, and all that remains is a bog standard puzzler that's been done better a thousand times before. Well, dude, it's been radical. Later. I confess to never having read any opus accredited to Daedalus, but I fear if it was anything like the script in this game, it's been lost amidst the more poetic chronicles of Homer and Sophocles. Daedalus was, in fact, a sculptor of master renown in ancient Greece, as every Game Boy owning kid in Japan and North America knows, right? In a similar vein to early puzzle games like Psyraid, 
The box art isn't exactly representative of what the game involves. Here we have what appears to be an ancient Greek guy, complete with pillar and outline of Greece, looking at some bricks with a puzzled face. Alright, it's a puzzle game based on bricks, but there's no reference to ancient Greece anywhere in this game. The art from the Japanese version, Buken Puzzle Road, is much more indicative of the gameplay, but for some reason the North American version had to be de-Japanesed. This was a not uncommon practice back then. To go back to Psyraid briefly, the Japanese box art looked exactly like what was in the game, two soldiers in a futuristic lab being attacked by monsters. The North American one had a shiny silver head, disembodied in space for some reason. You can forget international cliches when it comes to video game box art. Often it was less weird in Japan. I've mentioned the script in Dedalian Opus. The first incarnation of the game was in Japanese, meaning the English version was translated. This begs the question, if you knew you were going to force a Greek slant on the game, why would you voice the old man like a Bill and Ted tribute act? There's little to say about the game. You play as this little cartoon chap walking from island to island, stopping in a cave on each one, whereby he needs to rearrange five block shapes inside a frame to create a bridge leading to the next island. Along the way, UFOs will come along and drop down new pieces to use, until all possible configurations of five squares are present. So, was Vic Tokai theorising here that aliens helped build the Minotaur's labyrinth? Not just the pyramids, then. The game itself comprises of 36 levels, 42 in the Japanese version, starting simply and becoming very tricky indeed. By about level 12 you'll have all the bits to hand, but not all of them fit into each puzzle. There's a timer ticking up, but you don't need to finish within any time limit, it's purely for your own reference, and isn't saved anywhere. This game is decent, as balls basic as it comes, but quite addictive. Logic doesn't seem to factor a whole lot, trial and error will be employed more. The whole Greek thing was unnecessary and only partly implemented, which just serves to make it farcical. The little kid is clearly not the guy from the cover art, and his mentor is wearing a pair of dungarees like he's just been tiling the bathroom. Anyway, who is this mustachioed Dr. P who can apparently talk to fairies? What does he know about aliens? I don't remember him from Metamorphoses. Hey dude, you're on it again. Well, somebody was on something, that's for sure. Copier Systems didn't release a great number of titles on the Game Boy, and you could be excused for not being aware of the ones that they did. Go Go Tank and Popeye 2 were a couple of theirs, neither of which set the world on fire. In fact, Go Go Tank is kind of horrible. One of their better titles is 1990's Dead Heat Scramble. It's a rather strange checkpoint style top-down racing game, although you're not on a racetrack as such, and the only thing you're racing is the clock. I say it's not a racetrack, it's more like a toboggan truck or luge, or could even be interpreted as toy cars and some guttering. You're going from point to point over ten stages, down a tube thing with curved sides. There are obstacles to avoid or jump. Jumping is easier, but slows you down. The challenge in this game is not so much avoiding these, although they can be rather tricky. For instance, there are these rather huge looking boulders that seem to have quite a small hitbox. The detection is very generous on your behalf. The difficulty lies in beating the very tight time limit. Anything you hit makes your car flip out and lose time. You can never afford more than one or two crashes per stage. In order to beat the game, you have to pass all ten stages. Although there are infinite continues, you only keep your score through one life. The tracks don't change, but the movement is so fast and the sections so long that learning the layouts is pretty tricky. Just dodging everything isn't enough, though. You need to smash into other cars, which sporadically release power-ups. These include boosters that speed you up, and clocks that stop the time for a while. These are the necessary ones, as even with a flawless run, you'll probably not reach the end of the stage without these. 
You can also collect tyres that make turning much easier. You don't get the centrifugal force throwing you to the side of the halfpipe when you corner. And there's a bomb you can fire ahead of you too, which will score a ton of points if you hit a car or an obstacle. The music is chirpy and fast-paced and sounds great for the title. It really fits. However, for a racing game, there's a distinct lack of an engine sound until you get the Nitro Boost. Weird emission indeed. It's like having a shoot 'em up without a pew pew noise. Graphically, it's pretty rough on the original Game Boy. The speed of the gameplay makes for a lot of blurring. It looks much better on the color or advanced consoles which didn't have this problem and is much more playable. This was no comfort to people in 1990 though. It's amazing what people will put up with when there was no alternative. 